people self sabotage all the time in relationships and lots of different things because they don't realize the power of their mind and their thoughts are creating their reality they're recreating things over and over again when anyone complains if they can at least just stop themselves from complaining that alone will change their life because all they have to do is say okay i'm complaining because i'm in fear of something that's the only reason i'm complaining about this person i'm being negative about that situation is because i don't want to look within i don't want to find they want to put icing on an unbaked cake they just want everything i just want to be positive i just want to be positive don't talk to me about negativity you know they're, they're all of a sudden they're on a path of positivity and then they're afraid they're in fear of anyone saying anything negative that is no way to live it's no way to live it's like if you have a negative thought or you're complaining say to yourself i need to find out what i'm afraid of am i afraid of losing something that i now have or am i afraid of not getting what i want so if they can if people can find out and locate what it is within themselves that they're afraid of it dissipates that fear dissipates and a window of light opens up you know it's just it's miraculous one simple thing people attempt to teach people in a complicated way oh you've got to come through me but it's sick sacred teaching and i can't tell you unless you've gone through this level on that level and all this crap Hello, everyone, and welcome to a new episode of Set Lusting Bruce, your podcast all about Bruce Springsteen, his music, and mostly his fans. I am your host, Jesse Jackson. We're getting off the Bruce train, but I'm sure he will come up, as he always does. And we're getting to uh, musication. Uh, we are talking to the fabulous Michelle Blood this morning. Michelle, welcome to the podcast. Hello, Jesse. Lovely to be here. Thanks for asking, inviting me. Oh, no, I, I was excited. Uh, we, you know, we connected via, there's a lot of podcast networks out there. And <laughs> you had said you were looking to be guests. And I thought there was a synergy to us. So tell my audience a little bit about yourself. Well, hello, Aud Jesse Jackson audience. <laughs> uh, my name's Michelle Blood, obviously. G'day. I'm from Australia. Um, but I live in the States now and I was a rock singer in Australia. I started my professional career at five years of age. I went on to get really cool cover bands that became very popular and then started writing songs really badly at first. But then after a while, obviously it, my songwriting got a lot better because my band um, got a great record contract with Time Warner. We did lots of videos. We toured at one stage nonstop around Australia for seven years nonstop. We toured with the Pretenders in excess, you name it, lots of big bands uh, that came to Australia or that were Australian until eventually we had, you know, a few thousand people every night at our own concerts. I had a near fatal car accident, or well, actually a truck accident, um, coming home from a gig after 12 hours. Australia is huge. And you have to drive so far in between gigs, you know. So going from Brisbane to Sydney, I had a near fatal car, a truck accident, and um, the truck driver had fallen asleep at the wheel. And as the passenger, all the musical equipment went into me, and I was absolutely, literally, just broken bones everywhere, and splinters of bone in me in the hospital for months and months. However. <laughs> You would think that that would be the worst thing, right, Jesse, to happen sure, to a rock singer? Sure, of course. So, uh, you know, because how can I do what I do unless I can do my crazy antics on stage and, you know. Yeah, sure. Handstands, jumping on speaker boxes, you name it. <laughs> and so uh, it was ended up being the best thing that ever happened to me. So anyone who's had something horrific happen to them, be patient and you'll – you'll see eventually your landscape will become 360 degrees of positivity and light. 
you might have to go through some crap to start with, but it's well, well worth it. But that's, that's what I consider the beginning of my journey, even though I was doing, working so hard as the lead singer, songwriter, manager of the band, getting agents, getting gigs. I mean, I worked so hard, but it paid off because we ended up being very popular. <laughs> so I, I I love that. And, and we're going to get into that. I always like to start at the beginning. So growing up, what what kind of music did your family listen to? What what was your musical roots as a as a young person? uh Australian well mainly my father he had an amazing record collection I mean he even had pictures of Matchstick Man and MacArthur's Park is Melting in the Dark and he would also had you know 1812 Overture would be he'd always had an amazing stereo and um I used to buy all my little singles and as a little girl I would you know pretend lip sync even at the age of three and with a brush in front of the mirror sure <laughs> And um, so it was very eclectic, actually. He has a very, very good taste in music, lots of different types of music. But then again, my mother and father married when they were very young. So he was only, you know, I'm growing up and he's only in his 20s when he's, right. you know, buying all this cool music. So, yeah, <laughs> Beatles. Did, yeah. When did you, did you always embrace your family's music or did you go through a rebellion stage when you were a teenager where you wanted your own kind of music? Uh, no, um, my mother and father divorced when I was very young. And so uh, my mother worked full time. And so I just got all my own music. I joined what was called the American Record um, Club. And I would get all this really cool music that wasn't even released yet in Australia. I've got wow. Slade Alive, Slade Alive, the first Prince album. I mean, I, I just, I loved everything. I liked Alice Cooper. I, I loved everything. I was always more towards the rock side than the pop side. But, okay. um, but, but, you know, I mean, I left school, I left home when I was 15 because I knew I was going to be a singer and that was it. So, you know, I was so gonna, I pr pretty much, I pretty much brought myself up. <laughs> so is, I was going to ask that is, um, I have a friend uh, who is an artist, uh, Tom Zoller, and he, tells the story like from the moment he remembers consciousness and put a crayon in his hand he knew that a, a, an artist is what he wanted to be he wanted to create art and so from a very early age you knew you wanted to be a musician oh gosh yeah i mean i i apparently they said i was extremely shy didn't speak much but when i was up on a stage they put me up on the kitchen table when i was about three Mum couldn't believe I wouldn't remember all the songs on the radio verbatim, every lyric, and sing all these songs. And I actually wrote when I was only five, I wrote to the local television station that had this kids program. Mm -hmm. And I said, I'd like to come in and audition. And they knew it was a kid's handwriting and they called my mum and she couldn't believe it because my mum never encouraged my singing or my father. No one did in my family. Yeah. My brother, my sister, nobody. I kept it to myself and they were just shocked. Because they didn't really know what I was capable of. Right. <laughs> did so. Did, yeah. Why? <clears throat> why at fifteen did you decide to go out on your own? Oh, it was just um, challenging at my home. I had a, I had a very disturbed sister, and so okay. it was safer for me. It was safer for me just to leave home and get a job and and do my music and you know, so. <laughs> yeah. So that's what I did. No one so, stopped me. Yeah. It's not like these days. These days they'd have the police after you. But back yeah. in those days, nobody stopped you from doing anything. My mum was too busy to think about the kids. She was working, single working mother yeah. at that stage. And um, I was just always very independent. My mother didn't worry about me. She used to make all the food and do all the ironing for the kids, you know. So I was always sort of like a little mother myself. So, yeah. <laughs> So what was the first steps into being, to make a living as a music? What it, did you, how'd you start out? What, what, tell me those steps. Oh, I didn't make any money to start with. Oh, of course with not, after, but yeah. After, yeah, I did hairdressing. I did, I worked in bars. I, I did cleaning. I, I just did, you know, and I was really good student at school. So my, my, no one could believe it. Like, why are you just leaving your education? I just did everything I possibly could and just learn as many songs. I would get musicians together. I moved 
from um, Sydney to a place called Coffs Harbour. And when I was about 18, I got my first really good band together. It was a cover band. We started touring all over Australia. And I learned a lot through doing all those covers. You know, it was pretty amazing to be able to, and back in those days, there weren't many female singers having hit records. So mm -hmm. I had to do a lot of the male songs that are, were around back then, which was really good to test your voice and to learn how to do five or six sets a night and not lose your voice. I learned a lot in the first few years. And then when I was about 23, I got my first really good band. I started headhunting bands all over the country. I like that drummer, I'm getting him. I like this guitarist. Until eventually I got a great band together and they were just fantastic guys. And I'm only five foot and everyone, every one of those guys was over six foot two. <laughs> I, I, I can see that on stage. Um, <laughs> what do you think makes a great band? You mentioned oh, you had a great makes... band. Is it, is it, is it chemistry, musical skill, a little bit of both? Oh, it's definitely to start with. I wouldn't look at the, per how they looked or the personality or anything to start with. I would just audition everybody over and over again until I found someone who was not just really good at their instrument, but they were also enjoyable to watch. And right. so I, I would really just audition and audition, bring them back, bring them back. Um, and if I, like, I found this bass player who was really good, but he still hadn't learned how to really slap like I like a bass to be. Okay. So, uh, so I got him with a friend of mine who was in a really famous band in Australia. I got the bass player from that band to teach him because he was just so good and he could play a lot of different instruments. And so, and, uh, you know, great drummers. And every time there was a new type of, you know, syndromes or whatever it was, I would get the best drum sets for them and um had fantastic keyboard player just like a mozart <laughs> keyboard player brilliant and i made sure that they could uh, i'd have at least two of them that could sing okay so, they, so, so, so that we could always do three-part harmonies because i've always felt that harmonies are so important and i made sure that they weren't drug abusers or alcohol abusers i mean i was really fussy because in australia if if you have one gig that's blown, you're booked six months in advance. You have no gigs for six months. You have to go out searching for the gig. So this is why if, if um, I was very, I mean, they used to call me the, jokingly, they loved me, but they used to jokingly, the guys would call me Till of the Hun. <laughs> yeah. Because yeah. I, I, I was just going to ask you that, it, and you kind of, it sounded like you were a pretty tough taskmaster. Well, you have to be, and I think every band that's really good. I mean, I know bands that were really good, but they had to have a really tough manager at the, who would help them, you know, get through it. And I was the manager of the band, but I mean, I did it in a very positive way. I always wanted everyone to be positive and happy, but, you know, I said, if you look at the resume of my bands, you'll see there's many, many people that have been fired. I don't want to fire you. I want you to become part of this family. And, um, and we'd get along really well. And I would just, you know, we had great road crew who were just brilliant. And uh, yeah, you have to be like that because I had experienced too many times failing because there were certain band members that were just undisciplined. They just wouldn't turn up in time. And you know, it's really challenging. It's like herding cats after a while. <laughs> yeah. You know, Bruce says in his biography that he was in a lot of bands in his early days, and he decided that he wanted to do a benevolent dictatorship. He wanted, <laughs> right. you know, like he wanted to be, quote unquote, the boss uh, right. because he had a vision. He knew what his music, he needed his music to sound like, and he knew what he needed it to perform, and he expected a professionalism. So he was similar, um, you know, no excessive drinking. He said no drugs, though. Uh, Clarence Clemens said that a lot of times what Bruce didn't know didn't hurt them. Uh, you know, but <laughs> it's probably because, the same in my case, too, I bet. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, was there, is there a moment that stands out, Michelle, when in your early career where you went, yes, okay, 
we've made it. And not that it's the peak of the mountain, but when you went, okay, this is clicking. All right, we're, we're onto something pretty special. Yeah, that's a really good question. And I'm not going to mention the name of the band, but it was a band that were really American band. And um, we were gigging with them as their, as you know, the first band on. Yeah. when we realized that our audience was bigger than their audience <laughs> and we were nice. just like we were just like when they came on and half the audience left and we were like oh my god and after that the record label started giving us our own head headlining and with an, another band like we'd have our band mm -hmm. uh, as the main headline band so that was sort of yeah. a real yeah. startling thing because i didn't really take any notice about you know, they've obviously, I would just think they've obviously come to see blah, 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 because they're huge. Yeah. And um, yeah. they'd come to see us. It was crazy. <laughs> what time period was this? Late 80s. Late 80s. And what what was the name of the band you were touring in? Was oh, it? Oh, I had. A, that band was called Glasswork. Okay. But we had a lot of different name changes over the years. Okay. Clapping hands. I mean. Oh, goodness me. L-O-V-E, Love of Vast Experience, was a band after that. Um, because after my car accident, I put another band together. Uh, I didn't immediately stop doing rock and roll. I, re I really never really did. I still, yeah. even when I lived in Asia, I got bands together. And But what I did find I loved was being a solo artist because I could hire, when I went to the recording studio, I could hire any session musician I wanted. I did this song with Kino from Big Mountain mm -hmm. uh, in Scandela Luz on Me, It's Your Turn Tonight, that I wrote. And I had Phil Collins' brass section. This is just not that long ago, really. Mm -hmm. Phil Collins' brass section and this, and most of, you know, the guitarist from Santana. I mean, I could just hire whoever I wanted. It was amazing. And they're not expensive in America to hire these guys. I can't believe it. I guess when they're off the road from the people they work with, they need yeah. gigs. <laughs> So I'm going to go back to, as you self-described, a major turning point in your life. Um, you've been in the accident. You're laying in the hotel room. What were your initial thoughts? And what was there one or uh, several things that kind of turned you around and and gave you hope? Or were you – are you – it sounds like you're an internal optimist. Like a few years ago, 2015, I was diagnosed with colon cancer. And a lot Ooh. of people were saying, oh, were you afraid? And I was, I, I wasn't never afraid because I was like, it, it's gonna be okay. It's, it's just gonna be okay. And I had no, no scientific reason, everything. It's just, I, I just believed that it, it's gonna work out. So, Talk to me about your time in there. When I was in the hospital for all those months, months and months and months, one of the operations was 17 and a half hours. Wow. Uh, it, took a, it took a few months before I could even think because I was in such, you know, I was, I was in traction. You know, you've got to be in traction before certain operations and you've still got broken bones. And, and it's, it is anyone who's ever been in traction, I would just pass out. All the time because the pain was so horrific so you don't have time to think what in the f is happening you just yeah. you just i just don't want to be in pain anymore you know and um it, you know i would beg there's there were certain orderlies who who had to lift me every few hours and that was just unbelievable so i would offer them i would say look i'll, I'll give you anything if i can get greg back and this other guy back because they don't hurt me and you guys yeah. hurt me you know? so i would like scream get me greg sure <laughs> so anyway but after many operations and i realized i was going to survive i may not walk properly again but i was going to at least survive i only had a couple more operations left and I'd still have to be in the hospital for many months. But there was, um, people were putting on positive things for me to listen to because they thought that would help uplift me. But at the time it didn't, because when you're in that, you're resonating at that low oscillation through physical pain and someone comes in like they're farting daisies. Hi, how are you? Yeah. <laughs> you, know? you, don't, you don't want them around, but they would put these um, audio books on that I couldn't turn off. 
And I'd never been into the motivational stuff or self-help. I didn't need to be. I was living my dream. Even though it was a tough world, I was still living my life and I loved it. And um, So you're Napoleon not listening Hills, to you're not listening to Tony Robbins, Zig Ziglar, other I didn't know who any people. of them were. Okay. <laughs> um anyway, I'll just make this this longer part of my journey as short as possible because you know we your can get time into is the only thing we're concerned i i love rambling <laughs> answers so <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> all right so they put on which is really bizarre this is like totally ridiculous i said why are you putting on this motivational speaker type person think and grow rich i hadn't even heard of the book and it's an it's a book for those who haven't heard of it written by napoleon hill in the 1920s in america about male millionaire entrepreneurs what had that to do with a female young female singer in australia uh who wanted to be healed but it was the the one thing that i got i got it like you know when you said you just know it's all going to be okay when he talked about his little infant son who was born absolutely 100% deaf, could not hear, impossible to hear ever again. But Napoleon Hill didn't agree with that because of his studies of people's mindset and the way that they have created things in their life through willpower and positivity. He would go into his little infant son's room every night and go, you hear perfectly. You are an astounding, brilliant young man. People love you. You love people. You hear perfectly. Your hearing is perfect. He did this every night. I don't know. Maybe they didn't have recordings back then. <laughs> he had to do it, you know, or maybe it was just the energy of his own voice doing it. His little boy went on to get 30% hearing by the age of four. And um, he went on to become a, one of the hugest uh, p people to really get the hearing aid industry going. And so I just knew affirmations okay that makes sense i know all of my life i have used my willpower i've made an intention even when it sounded impossible to other people and i've made it happen so i do believe in the power of the mind i hadn't really thought about it that way so right. i did an affirmation and napoleon so you have said you have to say a positive statement that you want to have happen that hasn't happened in your life yet as if you've already got it and you have to emotionalize it and so that it'll go into the treasury of your subconscious mind and then it will plant a new seed of positivity to heal your body or, or whatever it is you want to manifest or create. And so I said, okay, I am healed because I wasn't. I am healed. I know I am. I didn't know I was. I love myself. I am my friend. I didn't love myself. I wasn't my friend. I said, oh, bingo. I have got the perfect affirmation because none of this is true. It's all BS. So I'm ready. I'm ready to go. <laughs> But um, I kept saying, I am healed. I know I am. I love myself. I am my friend. But I, they didn't know about neuroscience and the studies that have been done on music back in those days. So uh, what happened to me was I every time I attempted to say the affirmation, my doubting mind, I mean, the doctors are coming in. I'm still in physical pain. Sure. I'm still on a steel, steel flat bed. I still can't read. Um, I haven't even got a mattress or a pillow because of the traction. And it's like, um, it's not true. So my doubting mind would keep spitting it out. And this is why when people attempt to think positive thoughts to start with, they don't believe it. So it doesn't go into the treasury of their subconscious mind. But after a few months, I had a, a real epiphany, like lightning bolt epiphany. Oh, you silly little blonde. <laughs> You're a singer songwriter. You've even written jingles over the years, which I never told the band because that would have been really uncool, but it was good money. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> so I said, you can't get a jingle out of your head. Why do advertising agencies spend billions every year? Why do I get so much money when I'm even just singing a jingle? Is because you can't get the product out of the head once you've got the song in the head. Children, ABCs, they learn their ABCs through singing them like yeah. that. And so I just started singing onto the little cassette player, got someone to get a 90 minute cassette. I am healed. I know I am. I love myself. I am my friend. And I would sing it over and over and over again. And I listened to it nonstop. I asked my brother to go out and get 
get positive affirmation music for me. And he said, I went to every record store. He said, there's nothing, new age stores, everything. He said, there's nothing like that. They've just got like chanting, Indian chanting. And um, so I had miraculous healing. Journalists found out about me in Australia, about my miraculous healing, because people, you know, were coming to see me, different band people and stuff. And so I ended up being on television a lot, talking about my healing. I had no intention of recording for the public affirmation songs. That's not rock and roll. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's just, just for my healing. However, I did go into the studio and started recording a lot of affirmation songs that I was starting to write uh, just for me and my band, just for our own consciousness, because I started really, once that light bulb has come on and you want to know about consciousness, you want to know about mind power, you want to know about how these miraculous things manifest. And so I was like obsessed. I would do, I'd do a gig and in between sets, I'd be reading books, you know, like, um, autobiography of a yogi and all this different stuff. I was just obsessed. And so one day uh, a promoter came to me and asked me to come and sing at these huge events. He said, they're huge, three, four, 5,000 people. And I said, well, that's not that huge. I said, we get that many people at our gigs. He said, no, 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 this is different. This is like, I want you to work with this first one. It's there's a man called Dr. Deepak Chopper. I'm sure you've heard of him. I said, no. There's another guy called Dr. Wayne Dye. I'm sure you heard of him. No. Uh, and and a few other people, you know, that were big. Sure. They're all American. And we want you to come and sing in between each speaker, your affirmations, and get the audience up like you do at your gigs. Have the affirmation songs up there and you can sell them at the back of the room. And I said, sell them to the public? <laughs> I yeah. Said, I said, that's not that's not a, like a record record. It's just little pop songs, affirmation songs. And, um, but a little more sophisticated than that. But, um, so they offered me $5,000 a gig, which was insane to me because when you are Australian, even if you're well known, you make no money until you've become really big overseas. Cause only back then it was only 19 million people in Australia. I mean, even in excess, Michael Hutchinson's borrowed money from my row crew once to buy a burger after a gig. <laughs> wow. <laughs> You just don't make any money because it all goes to the road crew or the equipment and all the rest of it. So I was blown away. That was probably more than I'd make in two years, just me, you know, and sure. except for the except for the jingles. <laughs> we won't talk about that. Yes. Anyway, so uh, I couldn't believe it. I just couldn't believe it. It was amazing. And then more and more promoters asked me, then they wanted me to work with Bob Proctor. If people don't know about Bob Proctor, he was in The Secret, but back then he wasn't. Um, he didn't want me to sing. He came out from Canada and the promoter said, no, she's singing. She's singing. She brings in a different type of audience as well because she's well known here and you, you won't believe it. And after the first um, half of the evening, it was at um, what's the Four Seasons now, but the Regent back then in Sydney Harbour, beautiful hotel. And um, he came backstage and he said, I did not want a female singer, some singer at one of my events. And I was like, well, nice to meet you too, mate. Hi, yeah, Bob. thanks. Yeah. <laughs> and then he started laughing and he said, but this is the most miraculous thing I've ever seen. He said, I couldn't believe the audience. He said, I remember those songs, Magnet to Money and I Am Energy. Now, all the lyrics, melody. He said, this is amazing. It goes straight into the subconscious mind, the lyrics into the left side of the brain. Did you realize this young lady? And the music into the right side, straight into the subconscious mind. I said, yeah, I have a... I had a bit of a an idea that that was what was going on. <laughs> He's talking, talking to me as if I didn't understand because he didn't know my story yet, right? Right. <laughs> and so uh, he, him and his wife just said, you, you know, I don't care what happens. You're, you're coming with us all over the world. I ended up working with Bob for about seven years, creating products, got him a best-selling book. I knew how to promote and market things because I'd done it for my band for years. And I ended up getting hit records. I, I, every country I went to, singing in different languages, my own songs. It was just, it was crazy. And um, that's really where I went into an even higher state of consciousness and decided to give all of that up for quite a while so that I could focus on enlightenment and meditation. So that's like, this is like now the third chapter is about to happen. Ooh. <laughs> Yeah, so I'm going to talk about that in a minute, but I had a couple of 
just thoughts and comments. One, I, I can remember, I think all of us that grew up in a household where you went to church on a regular basis, right? There's, there's a reason why they do songs between Bible readings and the sermon and everything, right? To get the audience engaged. Um, I remember going to camp, right? And I, um, there, I remember once one of the youth leaders says, you guys are dead. You guys just are half asleep. I know this song always gets you up. And so they started singing a song and everyone gets their energy going. Uh, so that makes a lot of sense. I've gone to one of those, um, my words, not your super shows where there's multiple, you know, um, motivational speakers and how to sell better and how to, you know, control your life. And in between sessions, you're just kind of mumbling around and you may go get a Coke or something. And so I could see the power of someone coming out and going, Hey, let's get the, cause you're, you're getting the energy going. You're almost, you're a warm up act. Like the on a TV show, they have a comedian warming up the audience so that when they start filming. The other thing is I I did there was a thing going around the internet a few years ago uh about they gave the first part of a commercial, like the best part of waking up is Folgers in your cup. You know, and they left that and they said, you know. Um, it has been over 20 years since that commercial ran, but everyone remembers it. So your point of it getting into your subconscious makes a lot of sense. Before I get to your third chapter, I do want to know what was the first gig you did back in your first phase when you were a musician after you're out of the hospital? Do you remember that gig and that sense of I can't believe I'm back out here after all that I've gone through. No, I never really did much <laughs> reflecting. Okay. So <laughs> I was always just... Just, just taking action. Uh, I remember yeah. it, it was a, a cover gig. Um, okay. I decided, I decided to, um, I wanted to make a lot of extra money. This is before I got the promoters getting me to do this stuff. So yeah. I actually, got my band to uh, because we couldn't tour at the time but we were all in sydney so i got my band to re recreate ourselves we, as a cover band but sort of incognito wigs and all this sort of stuff and um i remember that was so much fun because we did medleys of blondie and abba and blues brothers and i just found that so much fun and i'd never really done anything that professionally as a cover band okay and so that actually helped support us writing new songs and recording because i didn't i never thought at that stage that i was going to be just going overseas and having fifty thousand yeah, yeah. people come to an event and, <laughs> and doing all these big seminars on my own as the main person the singer the speaker i had no clue that that was all laid before me so um that was i just had so much fun doing cover band in a pub that only had about 500 people all drunk. It was just fun. <laughs> do you still every once in a while do that? No, 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 no. Do you miss no. it? No. <laughs> no. Okay. You're busy enough with the, with the full-time gig. Yeah. Well, I mean, I still sing. Yeah. Um, at, a, at events, but they're, um, you know, sometimes they're spiritual, big spiritual events. Sometimes they're just a big seminar event that people have asked me. I mean, Tony Robbins, Bob Proctor. I mean, all those people play my music. I mean, I just had a record producer from the UK who used to work at Stock Ackman and Waterman who went to a gig in um, Italy, a big gig with American speakers because he started getting into, he had healing as well. So he started going to yeah. different big events and, um, and he heard my music. They were playing my music. They didn't ask me, but I don't care. They can play it. <laughs> I don't, I don't, I never worry about plagiarism or anything, but they're playing me singing magnet to money. And he finally tracked me down and he said, uh, I want to do a dance mix of magnet to money. He said, they, I, I asked them, who's that you're playing? And they said, Oh, we don't know. And he said, well, you should know you, you haven't even mentioned her name or the name of the album. It's all her songs. 
And so he said, I think you should do something about that and get royalties. And I was like, no, I don't care about that. But we're going to do a, a dance mix of Magnet to Money. So that'll be fun. Okay, that does sound fun. Um, so you've, you've, <clears throat> you've had a successful career as a touring musician, leading bands. You then had a successful career being a, a warm-up act for and, and a motivational speaker. And so you decided, like peanut butter and chocolate, put two great things together. And you decided, maybe I have a calling. Maybe I have, as you said, a divine purpose that I should be telling people that and I talk about this a lot when I invite guests. I said, join me because I think my show is about the power and the magic and the healing power of music, not just Bruce's music, but all music. And so I love having people come in and share their story. So you said you you, you got off the road and you started doing some studying. So tell me chapter three talk to me about uh your reinvention and what called you and what steps did you take okay well at this stage i was just doing a huge amount of events and putting a lot of events for me and bob um making it like a rock thing bob sure. proctor loved that and then many other people asking me to come and sing or speak or be the main you know keynote person so i was doing a lot of that but what happened to me was because i'm singing all these positive songs and i'm writing books by now and i'm doing talks at big events my oscillation my frequency was speeding up and i felt like there was this heart glow and i'd be like what's this what is this feeling <laughs> this heart glow yes, and i would start he hearing humming through my body and like waves of like bliss coming through me and I knew it was a higher consciousness. All the things I've been reading from Yogananda and Swami Muktananda, play of consciousness. Uh, I was just really into spirit. And so I decided to look for an enlightened teacher because apparently that was the next thing to do, find someone who's enlightened. And I couldn't find anyone who was enlightened. And I went to many, many different countries. There was, someone said Sai Baba was, but I went and saw him and it just like looked like a magic show. I didn't feel any love for him or anything. <laughs> Sorry, Sai Baba. Anyway, and um, sometimes people would say, oh, we found one. There's a Zen guy in Japan, so I'd fly over there. So basically I kept working for about 14 years, ended up living in America and I was still looking for a teacher. And then I met this wonderful uh, person who, uh, John Indara, who had an enlightened teacher. I met him looking for an, a teacher. I went to do this, this Indian guy uh, in California, this church he was speaking. And uh, he, they, he said he was enlightened. And he talked about knowing Babaji. And I was like, well, you have to be a pretty high being to know Babaji because he's been living for 4,000 years and he's a pretty big daddy, you know? <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and so uh, I met him, John, at this event. And he said, he just came up to me when I was looking at the CDs and books. And he said, for some reason, I think you know what an enlightened teacher would be. Do you think this guy's enlightened? And I said, I don't know if he is or not, but he's not my teacher. I would recognize it. And then he ended up doing business with me and becoming a very good friend and then making beautiful websites because he's a brilliant you know, computer whiz and believed in what I was doing and loved what I was doing. And he said, one of my, as our students, because his teacher had left the body, his teacher was like a Yogananda, like a, a Mahasiddha, like beyond enlightened. And he said, uh, you know, they say that we, as far as we know, she's the only student so far out of all his thousands of students who became enlightened. And so I went to see her in a little, a little place, a little museum in Balboa Park, San Diego. And, you know, just a little bit of lighting, a little microphone, a tiny little stage, no big effects or anything. I got right up front. It was only about 80 people. Yeah. And I started feeling my head vibrating and tingling. I just knew immediately she was my teacher. She was in line, then she is. She's not teaching now, but I decided to get off the grid. And once she agreed to teach me, and I just mm -hmm. flew wherever she said, turn up here, turn up in Egypt turn up here. I would just go and, and I started studying deeply and deeply 
the the mystical way to enlightenment not ever for a moment jesse thinking i would become awakened right but i did i did after a few years and um i'm her only student also who has become awakened and now i have students from all walks of life i teach so many different things i want everybody to be able to get what they want so that then they can focus on their inner world so i right. love to still do a lot of podcast TV shows talking about the music and getting people because I've got you know hundreds of songs, affirmation songs and other songs that are positive that help you. But I also want them to go in and find that place within themselves where there is bliss, where there is joy, where there is no fear, where there are opportunities and you can see and feel the divine vibrating through everything because it is beyond any sort of fame beyond any amount of money it's beyond anything anyone could imagine you think you've had a good orgasm this is a million times better <laughs> okay <laughs> so it's just it, it, and everyone has the opportunity to become awakened or at least more awakened than they are now even if not fully awakened and that will change anybody's life the amount of, they'll be able to attract whatever they want into their life but they're not attached to it anymore they don't judge anymore they don't feel reactionary to people anymore and when you don't feel reactionary you're not judging and you're not complaining anymore you're a happy person sure. because most people most people complain because they're trying to block whatever they're in fear of you know obviously you're not like that because even when you had colon cancer you decided no oh, i'm going to get through this because the power of the mind with your higher self your divine spirit i call it your diamond is omnipotent can do anything <laughs> do you what do you find that many people is there one or two things that people do that you feel like self sabotage them from being their best selves to being oh, happy 100% Jesse people self sabotage all the time in relationships and lots of different things because they don't realize the power of their mind and their thoughts are creating their reality. They're recreating things over and over again. When anyone complains, if they can at least just stop themselves from complaining, that alone will change their life because all they have to do is say, okay, I'm complaining because I'm in fear of something. That's the only reason I'm complaining about this person. I'm being negative about that situation is because I don't want to look within. I don't want to find, they want to put icing on an unbaked cake. They just want everything. I just want to be positive. I just want to be positive. Don't talk to me about negativity. You know, they've, they're, all of a sudden they're on a path of positivity and then they're afraid. They're in fear of anyone saying anything negative. That is no way to live. It's no way to live. It's like if you have a negative thought or you're complaining, say to yourself, I need to find out what I'm afraid of. Am I afraid of losing something that I now have or am I afraid of not getting what I want? So if they can, if people can find out and locate what it is within themselves that they're afraid of, it dissipates, that fear dissipates and a window of light opens up, you know, it's just, it's miraculous. One simple thing, people attempt to teach people in a complicated way. Oh, you've got to come through me, but it's sick, sacred teaching. And I can't tell you unless you've gone through this level on that level and all this crap. They're just selling something. They're just assholes. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, you know, send me $59.95 and you too will have all the success you want in life. Right. Yeah. For the rest of your life, every yeah. But anyway, um, I just say kiss. Keep it simple and spiritual. The greatest lessons that can change our lives are very, very simple. And uh, you just got to do everything in a loving way. All you have to do is stop complaining, sprinkle kindness wherever you go, make sure that you remember. Uh, we've just finished an app called Magnet to Money app, uh, only for iPhones at the moment. And we've got morning meditations where people focus on a kindness, success, whatever the word is of the day, just eight minutes a morning. And then a, a, a prosperity guided, I call it the angel, guiding them into their sleep and saying all these beautiful affirmations to them. Mm -hmm. And then the magnet to money song. And it's, it's, it's my favorite uh, thing that we've ever put together because people, they don't get lazy. What happens is they get fired up about something that's going to change their life and then they forget about it. 
So if you've got notifications through an app, technology is brilliant for so many reasons. For some reasons, it's terrible, but many reasons, and you can take positive action towards having it as a positive thing when it's going to help you change your mind. Even when you don't remember to do it, it will remind you to do it. And so I think everyone has an opportunity to awaken to success in their life and to have what I call, you know, it's like when you're a musician, you don't say you're going to work, you're going to play, you're going to a gig. <laughs> yeah, uh, Bruce has said, right, there's a reason why they call it playing music, not working music. Right. There should be a sense right. of joy. You know, I, I, I want to go back to you mentioned a the repetition and there are reasons why people um, do mantras. There's reason why Catholics do the rosary and like even Bruce's into the fire song from his rising album. May your strength give us strength. May your faith give us faith. May your hope give us hope. May your love give us love. And it repeats that multiple times in the song. It just it it is a it is a prayer. It is a self, a, 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 as you talked about, right? Giving yourself self alphoration. I can't talk this morning. You know, self, uh, self yeah. fulfilling prophecies. <laughs> yes, it is in a pos and, in a positive way. <laughs> right, and and I do think that um, we talk a lot about this in business. Is that you are on a um, a a self a downward spiral because the, your actions keep bringing you back that or you can make your actions that pushing forward and no one is saying this is a magic wand there is there's always going to be rough parts in your journey and um my favorite springsteen song is better days uh which is him talking about that too many people wait for their ship to come in and then they'll be happy. And my argument is people will say, well, when I get that promotion, then I'm going to be happy at work. When I get the kids out of the diapers, then I'm going to be work. When I find my partner, then I'm going to be happy. And I go, you have to enjoy the journey. Even the rough parts of the journey, it says you're here, you're alive and uh, want to go through that. You said that you, uh, I've kept you uh, almost 45 minutes, so I don't want to keep you too much longer, but you mentioned you've got um, a song to share with us. You have an offer for yeah. my listeners. And yeah. before I get to the Mary question, any final thoughts you want to share? Well, I just think it's, you know, <laughs> it's just an amazing thing, this life. And I want you to know that I've I've got students and, and customers from, over 32 different countries and everybody is the same. We all want to love. We want to be loved. We want to be on purpose. We feel good when we make people happy. You feel so good when someone says, oh, how kind of you. So sprinkle kindness wherever you go. Stop thinking of yourself so much and think about what you can do with the day, with the planet, with the neighbors. What can you do to, for the community? What can you do for your own life to give you joy? You know, giving, tithing. There's so many things that are outside of your periphery right now that will change your life to the positive, to know that you are not alone and that you are loved. And it's like my favorite Bruce song is Born to Run. And I used to do it in a cover band and that's a hard song to sing. But I, the first time I ever heard it on the radio, I had shivers all through my body. My heart was out of my chest. And I was like, who in the F is that? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> you know, because we don't get all the American music in Australia all the time, you know. And I was just like, what is that sound? Who is it, this song? And, I mean, I just fell in love right then and there because Born to Run is just, I think, the greatest rock song of all time. It's just brilliant. Oh, anyway, um, I'll play the song. <laughs> okay, absolutely. This, and, by the way, this... if you want any more Bruce thoughts, my audience would love to hear them. <laughs> Oh, yeah, of course. I mean, I yeah. adore Bruce. Uh, who doesn't? If you don't, you're inhuman. <laughs> 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 Something up with you. Oh, I had it all set up. Oh, there it is. Uh, this is a song called Synergy. Um, 
that's about living your life in synergy. Okay, here we go. I'm not, I'm just going to play it. I won't sing along. It's not warmed up yet. <laughs> not really. Can you hear it? I can. Okay. Maybe I'll sing along. To make it happen, to get high, get firmly planted in the clouds. Join thoughts and let them fly. When your mind joins in with others. And how your thought energy begins to sizzle. And a new force has begun. It's synergy, red eyed energy. Positive energy, what's it to synergy? It's synergy, red hot energy, positive energy, what's it to synergy? song that is wonderful i love that and i i i normally just release the audio but i may have to release part of the video just watching listeners michelle was in her little chair dancing <laughs> along and you could tell that you are not used to sitting you are you are used to moving to the music i love that <laughs> thank you uh so you are very kind uh you have a special offer to my listeners yeah um i have some of my best selling song affirmation songs for your success the magic of affirmation power my latest book uh, the Magnetic Creative Visualization Program, where you get to visualize everything that you want to have happen in your life, as if it's already happening while you're floating on your cl cloud. The uh, great program Bob Proctor and I did called Turbocharged Action with the action song and teaching you how to put together a goal, even if you don't know what it is you want yet. And also the Practice and Meditation video. These are all best-selling products you're going to get for free. And one of my favorite favorite for those who really want to change their consciousness within six weeks go for it with the deeper mysticism it's a six-week video course where i give you instructions on what to do piece by piece from your home to cleaning to your body to meditation really easy simple stuff keep it simple all of that free if you go to michelleblood.com m-i-c-h-e-l-e B L O O D. It's my daddy's name. It's not a rock and roll name. <laughs> Blood. <laughs> it's Irish. Michelleblood.com. In actual fact, when I was a singer in Australia, the record company made me change my last name because they thought I sounded too punk. Anyway, okay, michelleblood.com yes. <laughs> forward slash set lusting Bruce. You'll get all that stuff for free. And I will include the link in the show notes. Michelle, this has been just a joy. Thank you for getting up early on a Saturday to visit with me. This was wonderful. Uh, before I let you go, though, I end every uh, podcast with the Mary question. So uh, if so you are that? a fan of Michelle and you are listening to this, uh, thank you for joining. I hope you check out some other episodes. But Jay Armstrong was an honors English teacher who recently retired. Uh, and when he was teaching, he would take two days apart and would break apart Thunder Road as a poem. His seniors would discuss it. They discuss the lyrics. They would discuss the themes Bruce uses. And at the end of the two days, they would ask the question, does Mary get in the car? So Michelle, 
that's your question. Does Mary get in the car at the end of Thunder Road? Oh, I remember the guys wanted me to sing this song. Yes. And the lyrics, there's so many lyrics. And we they said, we have to play it tomorrow night. And I said, I'm not going to memorize all those lyrics by then. <laughs> <laughs> like that's just a crazy song the lyrics that he writes it just he's a he's a genius um of course she did it's bruce he invites you you show up <laughs> very nice i love that answer all right if someone <laughs> all right we uh michelle blood uh dot com slash that listening bruce from there they can find all about uh, your different music, your books, all your things. Reach out to you if they have questions. And thank you so much for your time. Any final thoughts before we go? Oh, just everyone be born to run, be free. <laughs> I love it. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you, listeners. And we'll talk to you soon. Goodbye. Doing a podcast at times can be a one way conversation. And I hate that. So please let me know what you like and don't like about the work I'm doing. You can reach the podcast via email at setlessingbruce at gmail.com. The show is on Twitter at setlessingbruce, and my personal Twitter is at jessejacksondfw. You can support the podcast by subscribing via your favorite podcast player and leaving us a review. The more reviews we have, the easier it is for people to find us. And please tell a friend about the podcast, especially if they love Bruce or music, because it will make a difference. You just heard the fun talking, hard rocking, music loving, album ranking, fan thinking, joy spreading, lyric reading, story sharing podcast that is the one the only said listening Bruce. The theme for Set Lessing Bruce was written by David Rosen, used by permission. Oh, I did have fun. You're awesome. It's so fun to talk about, uh, to get more deeply into the my rock and roll days as well and talk about Bruce and just me having that memory of first listening to born to run it just i tell you just it blew me away i was just i was nearly in tears and when i'd sing it um i used to sing two songs that used to put me in tears when i sang them live was um separate ways of course okay steve who's ugh, amazing singer and yeah. born to run by bruce i mean just couldn't believe those two songs they're just two yeah. singers that are just out of this world so i don't know if you know this story but um they, uh, oh, and damn it, uh, Melissa Etheridge told the story yeah. that um, when she got big enough, they were going to let her do a special. And they say, who do you want to join? And she said, could we get Bruce Springsteen? And they said, well, let's ask. And so Bruce says, yes, I'll join you. And wow. so um, and so she says, okay, what do you want to do? And she says, I want to do Thunder Road. She said, okay, so, and she said, there's that line, so Mary climb in. And she goes, I want to sing that line so much because for so long I was in the closet and I couldn't say that I wanted Mary to climb in. And right. so it's really important to me. So you can Google this. If you Google for her that live special, she tells the story that she kept not saying the line when they got oh. to that line she didn't sing and oh. so if you google it the performance she sings it and bruce smiles and giggles a little bit because he knew she had not said it and sure enough if you watch it you could see him kind of smile like yes yeah, she nailed it so uh i just that's I, I I'm gonna have to see if I can I, I bet you just killed Born to Run I know it was a wonderful version but it's amazing when you watch Bruce sing yeah his mouth doesn't open wide it's always like Born to Run he it's was like... he was just on Howard Stern yeah and he said one of his gifts was he could and I'm doing a poor but he said I could sing kind of quiet like this, 
or I could really bring my voice up and I really didn't have to change that much. I didn't have to scream to do that projecting. It was just a gift he had. And you're right. It is, uh, someone told me, uh, I had someone on the podcast and she said, you know, I've heard Born to Run, you know, multiple times live. So I'm okay if he skips that. And I said, but think about it. Someone on that show concert, this is the first time they've seen Bruce perform live. And how disappointed will they be if they leave that auditorium and he doesn't do Born to Run? And oh, my guest God, said, that'd be, that'd be sinful. <laughs> yeah. And my guest said, I've never thought of it that way, Jesse. And you know what? The next time I see him live, I am going to embrace hearing that song as if it was the first time I've seen Bruce. Well, the, the way most singers do it, the way, way I always did it, and I, I think Bruce did that, and Steve Perry never needed to apparently because he just, you know. Yeah. Anyway, um, I would just say the biggest songs yeah. that had the highest range yeah. that were so many octaves and I'd have to really get, because I ne never liked to do falsetto. I wanted to be just sing, you know, right. and and I would um, save them for the encore. Okay. Always. Yeah. I would always save them because then I it wouldn't matter if I couldn't even speak properly because I used to shut up all day, every day, um, <laughs> traveling just to rest my voice. I had to. I couldn't I couldn't do it every night otherwise. But, um, yeah, so I think that's a good last song. It is him, a good last song. Because Our then... <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly. All right. I am going to include this little as a bonus on my episode, this little talk. Thank oh, you, Michelle. Good. Thank your team for coordinating with me. They are fabulous. You are fabulous. Yes, they are. Go enjoy your weekend. <laughs> Appreciate you. Thank you. Thank you, Jesse. Much love. God bless you. God bless you too. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.